What if that prologue from the first Lord of the Rings movie were adapted as the final season of a TV show, 10 episodes to tell the tale of the War of the Last Alliance? Well, that pretty much is the only way that any Second Age TV show could feasibly end. It's what every thread of every storyline so far should have been building to. In seasons 1 and 2 of this series, I talked about the tale of the Great Rings and the elves who forged them and their conflict with Sauron. In seasons 3 and 4, I talked about the tale of Numenor and the mortal men of that doomed island and their conflict with Sauron. And now, finally, we've come to season 5, where I will tell the tale of the alliance between elves and men and their conflict with Sauron. Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to the first half of Season 5 in my Adapting the Second Age series, or how the Rings of Power could have been written. If you've not seen the previous videos about Seasons 1-4, to four, I would recommend checking them out. This video will be better if you're familiar with the story so far, and that's because Season 5 of this alternate universe Rings of Power TV show is all about the culmination of the entire Second Age that's come before. This season is the hinge connecting seasons 1 through 4 to the stories of the Third Age, and specifically the Lord of the Rings right at the end of the Third Age. But just before I begin, let me say this video has pretty much nothing to do with like the actual Rings of Power TV show. I'm not reviewing that show, I'm not critiquing it, I'm not really even talking about it at all. This is simply a continuation and conclusion of a series that I began thinking about months before the first episode of the actual show aired. This is what the finale of a Second Age TV show might have looked like if the engine of adaptation and the momentum of the story were drawn out of Tolkien's writings, as opposed to kind of being manufactured in a writer's room and then projected onto those writings. And before I get into the specifics of the story, I'll give my obligatory spiel about what we should and should not have the rights to. Obviously, in a perfect world, a writer would be able to use everything Tolkien wrote in their Tolkien adaptation, but we don't live in a perfect world, and to be honest, it's very easy to say that a Second Age TV show should just follow Tolkien's writings to the letter, but if there's like legal reasons why that can't be the case, then it's not a particularly constructive statement for me to make. So, for the sake of being a little bit more creative than critical, I will, to an extent, play by the same rules as the showrunners in regards to rights. Sort of. This is not a high-budget Middle-earth adaptation, it's a YouTube video, so I'm not going to shoot it in the foot by trying too hard to ignore the Silmarillion and the Unfinished Tales, and there will be some moments where I do talk about non-Lord of the Rings writings because I just can't help myself, but my point is that whilst I've been making this series, I have been pretty blown away by how many Second Age details there are to be found in The Lord of the Rings and its appendices. It is still a little bit ludicrous to try adapting a Second Age show with just The Lord of the Rings and its appendices, considering that 95% of those writings are about the Third Age, but The Lord of the Rings is just so rich, and there's so much to it in the way of themes, and the things that Tolkien explores are so mythological and kind of universal that apart from some specific names that, yeah, we don't have the rights to use, a vast amount of what's actually necessary to tell this story is available to be drawn out of the Lord of the Rings. And although that's been true for every season of this hypothetical show, when it comes to the final part of this story, season 5, even more so. So there's not really any excuse for an unfaithful adaptation. This is the thing that the whole Second Age has been building to. It's the thing that will lay the foundations for the Third Age, the point of everything. The War of the Last Alliance. So, just like with Seasons 1 and 3, I think Season 5 should begin with a cold opening. One standalone scene to establish the crux of the story that's being told before even the opening credits roll. 
In seasons one and three, I opened with a scene of dialogue between two characters, who are on the one hand very different from each other, yet also both cut from the exact same cloth. In that scene, it was the super old mortal king of Numenor, Eleros or Tarminiatur, talking with his super youthful immortal twin brother, Elrond. And in this scene, we'll see a kind of thematic prequel to that. As we fade in on the first shot of the final season, we see absolute destruction. A land devastated by war, but beyond anything that's actually possible in the real world. This isn't the aftermath of a battle. It's more like how I imagine the Earth would have looked after the asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs. Utter apocalypse. There is no landscape beyond gaping chasms in the broken Earth. The sky is black with smoke. The ground is black with ash. There's not even any debris. No evidence of any life ever being here. Only the immeasurable scars of earth-shattering ruin. But among the biblical wreck of this cataclysm, we see a figure walking alone. And this figure looks out of place. Despite all the damage around him, this guy looks perfect, angelic, beautiful, wise, beyond measure, and there is light in his eyes. In fact, he doesn't look too dissimilar to how Sauron, the Lord of Gifts, looked back in Season 1. But this is not Sauron. This is a different Maya, a herald of the uttermost West. Sauron as he could have been. And as this angelic being of light and goodness walks among the astonishing devastation, he encounters someone else. A guy who is basically his opposite. Broken, humbled, defeated. A cloaked figure who looks about as damaged as the lands he's wandering. As the angelic being of light approaches, we see words appear on the screen. The end of the first age. And then their dialogue begins. I really think less is more here, but the through line of what's being discussed should be a conversation about redemption and repentance. The herald of the uttermost west shows mercy to the pitiful figure before him he tells him softly that it's over now. He can be free of the past, free of the first age. He can be Sauron no longer. The cloaked figure looks up, and we see that it is indeed Sauron. But unlike any version of Sauron that we've seen before, at the end of the first age he is beaten, vanquished, and subdued. Then, the Herald of the West offers Sauron a second chance. Come west with me. Kneel before the Valar and repent. Forswear the evil you have done, and the powers of the West will forgive you. All you need do is beg their pardon. The camera lingers on Sauron. And the making or breaking of this scene will be dictated entirely by the acting of whoever is cast to play this character, perhaps the most important character in the whole show. If the acting is on point, then we can convey a huge amount of Sauron's characterization without any need for words. There is a part of him that wants this. Forgiveness to be free of Morgoth, to join his people in the uttermost west. At the moment, he's ashamed, he's afraid, and he is tempted to be Sauron no longer. But he just can't do it. He can't allow himself to be humbled, to face consequences, to be at the mercy of another. In this moment, 
In the final moments of the First Age, we see Sauron make his most fateful decision. He will not beg for pardon. He will never kneel again. Not sincerely. He looks west, but he recognizes no authority save his own. Then he turns and looks east towards all that remains of Middle-earth. And then he walks away. If you've read the Silmarillion, then you'll know that this herald of the uttermost west is inspired by Aonwe. We don't have the rights to that name, we don't need them. This isn't a scene about name dropping from the lore, this is the most important scene in establishing Sauron's character. He is one of the only characters to feature in every single season of this show, but now that we've seen a glimpse of where he came from before the Second Age, hopefully it will recontextualize a lot of what we've seen previously. Before the Second Age began, Sauron had one foot upon a road to redemption. There was a part of him that genuinely wanted to take it, but he chose to turn aside. Sauron's pride set him on a different path, and where that different path will take him in the end is what Season 5 is all about. So, as Sauron walks east into a red sunrise and disappears among the destruction, the music begins to swell. And beneath it we should hear the rising sound of rushing water. A, as an allusion to the flooding of Beleriand, but B, as a way to transition to our next scene, which begins with a sweeping shot of a thunderous great river. The Anduin, another very important part of Season 5. And I think the most striking thing about this second scene should be its astounding contrast to the previous one. Instead of apocalyptic devastation, what we're seeing now is an immense river passing through green and fertile lands. On the west bank of the river stand great forests, and on the east bank, vibrant gardens. The camera follows the river, sweeping south, and as the music reaches its crescendo, we look down upon the great city that straddles the great river. A city so awe-inspiring that it looks like something that could have been built in Numenor. It is a city of two halves, bisected by the river, but joined by a great stone bridge. And at the heart of the city stands the massive Dome of Stars. This is Osgiliath, at the beginning of its days capital of the very newly established kingdom of Gondor. But the camera should not linger here. First, it should sweep west and bring us to another awe-inspiring white city that rises out of a green country. This is Minas Anor, the Tower of the Sun, the seven-leveled city that will one day be called Minas Tirith. But the camera doesn't linger here either. Instead, it sweeps back east, past Osgiliath to a third city, fair and silver against the dark mountains. This is Minas Ithil, the Tower of the Moon, the glowing city of light that will one day be corrupted and turned into Minas Morgul. Finally, the camera brings us back to where it started, the majesty and splendor of Osgiliath, the city of two halves, the capital between these two towers. We enter into that dome of stars and find two thrones set beside each other. On the western throne sits the lord of the Tower of the Sun, the son of the sun, Anarion. And on the eastern throne sits his elder brother, the servant of the moon, Isildur, Gondor's first two kings. As we zoom in on their faces, we should see words appear once again on the screen. 
the end of the second age. We don't need to state it explicitly, but there always has to be an answer to the question, what year is this set in? And I have chosen to begin season 5 in the year 3429 of the Second Age. That's 110 years after the end of season 4, which means the Kingdom of Gondor is 109 years old in this moment, and the Second Age only has 12 years left. So, after those first two scenes, we should probably have, like, the opening credits or whatever, and then we will get into the meat of the first few episodes. And unlike previous seasons, season 5 will actually have quite a few different storylines all going on at the same time. This season is a coming together of all previous seasons, so there will be a lot of moving parts. But focus is still key, so I think we should begin with a particular emphasis on the characters in Gondor. And specifically, we should focus on the guy who kind of is the main character of season 5, Isildur. If we follow Tolkien's timeline, then by this year, 3429, Isildur should be 220 years old. He's a Numenorean, so he's not going to look much older than about 40, but Isildur is no longer the young lordling that we met at the beginning of Season 3. Now he is a great king of a great kingdom. And he's also a father. At this time, Isildur has three adult sons. His eldest, Elendur, who we met towards the end of last season, and Elendur's two slightly younger brothers, Aratan and Kirion. Right in the first episode, I think both Isildur and Anarion should get the ball rolling by committing themselves to one of the main things that Season 5 is fundamentally about. Building alliances. Isildur should leave Minas Ithil in the care of his wife, Eyarien, I'll come back to her in a few minutes, and he should take his three sons, Isildur's heirs, and they should all ride west, a long way through the outlands of Gondor, across the river Ringlo, and up into the White Mountains. Which, fun fact, is basically the reverse journey of what Isildur's heir Ardagorn will make on his way to the Battle of Pelennor Fields in just over 3,000 years' time. Anyway, if you know the story, you'll know where I'm going with this, because it is in the foothills of these White Mountains that Tolkien tells us Isildur set the Great Black Stone of Erech, a very mysterious artifact of Numenor that will stand upon the hill of Erech all the way down to the days of Aragorn, and beyond. And the reason that the Stone of Erech matters is because this is where the pre-Numenorian middlemen of the mountains swore their fateful oath to fight alongside Isildur when the time came. As we know, this oath will go on to be broken, and these men of the mountains who swore it will go on to be the Oath Breakers. Obviously, these guys will be a very important part of the Lord of the Rings, but the beginning of their story is right here and now with Isildur, and quite importantly, I think, his heirs, in the last few years of the Second Age. So, these men of the White Mountains. Everything we know about them comes from the Lord of the Rings, which means we have no worries regarding rights. And I think the most important thing for us to establish in the first episode is that these men of the mountains are nothing like Isildur and his Numenorians. These guys are middlemen of Middle-earth. After the fall of Eregion back in Season 2, Sauron took control of much of southern Middle-earth and ruled over it for more than a millennium known as the Dark Years. Back in Season 3, the ancestors of these men of the mountains would have worshipped Sauron. But in Season 4, Sauron was brought to Numenor, and the Dark Years in Middle-earth slowly came to an end. At the end of Season 4, Numenor was destroyed. Sauron's body and a great deal of his power were destroyed also, but his ruling ring was not. 
Now, what Sauron's currently up to a hundred years later is still very much unknown, but both Isildur and Anarion are far too wise to believe that he was destroyed completely. Their kingdom of Gondor stands upon the doorstep of Mordor, hence the need for alliances. And something that's very cool about Season 5, in previous seasons I made a big deal about language, and how the Sindarin speaking elves and the Dúnedain would not have a common tongue with the native men of Middle-earth. But now that we are a hundred years into the history of Gondor, that's no longer the case. There is no more need for subtitles. During the span of the century since Season 4, Westron has slowly evolved into the common tongue throughout the Westlands, a common language spoken by the men of the mountains and the men of Gondor. It is a Creole language formed by the coming together of Numenorean Adunayak and the languages of the Middlemen, with a soft trace of Elvish influence favoured by the faithful Dúnedain. And as is the case in Lord of the Rings, Westron can be translated straight into English, or whichever language you're watching it in. By season 5, all of our heroes have a common language. Anyway, Isildur and his three heirs should ride up to the hill of Erech, and before the stone of Erech they have a meeting with these middle men of the mountains, and specifically with their king, the mortal man who will in 3,000 years be known as the King of the Dead. And as well as setting up, you know, plot stuff, this scene should also reveal how the Dúnedain, the exiles of Númenor, interact with the kind of indigenous people of what is now Gondor. As I say, only a century and a half ago, the ancestors of these men worshipped Sauron. But since the arrival of the Dúnedain, they're free of him, right? At least that's how it would appear. And so, the relationship between these two kings, Isildur and the not yet King of the Dead, is worth spending a bit of time on. It's important to see why the men of the mountains would swear their oath of loyalty to Gondor, and to explore the context of their eventual oath-breaking. I imagine Isildur and his sons coming to the Stone of Erech on a relatively regular basis, bringing gifts to their neighbours in the mountains. And I think the most significant gift that the Dúnedain would bring to the Middle Men should be the gift of Arthalas, King's Foil. In Lord of the Rings we are told that Arthalas was brought to Middle-earth by the Men of Númenor, and it only grew in places where the Dúnedain went. This is a uniquely Númenorian gift, and the healing properties of this plant would be of great benefit to the men of the mountains. Along with food and gold and probably weapons, the king of the mountains takes these gifts from Isildur, but they are not given freely. Isildur reminds these men that Sauron is gone, but not for good. If Mordor should ever rise again, the Dark Lord's attack will fall first upon Gondor, and specifically upon Minas Ithil. That's why Isildur built his city on Sauron's doorstep. All of Middle-earth is under his protection. And if the moment comes, Isildur swears that he will fight against the Dark Lord. The Dúnedain will fight against the Dark Lord. Gondor will fight against the Dark Lord, and the men of the mountains will fight alongside them. That is the deal. The future King of the Dead accepts these terms, but Isildur is unconvinced that these men have abandoned Sauron worship entirely. He tells them to renew their oath, swear it. Upon the stone of Erek, swear an oath by the name of Iluvatar. When Isildur calls them, they will fight. Perhaps the king could be somewhat reluctant, I guess he'd have no great love for the Dúnedain, but he does love their gold, and their weapons, and their Athalas, so he faces the stone, and under the witness of Isildur's heirs, 
He swears that should the need arise, he and his people of the mountains will fight for Gondor against the armies of Sauron. So that's kind of what Isildur is doing in episode 1, but whilst that's happening, I think we should have a similar scene, but in a different part of Gondor, with Isildur's brother, Anarion. As Isildur goes west with his sons up into the White Mountains, Anarion should take his son and go south, following the newly built Harad Road into an area known as Harondor. Throughout seasons 3 and 4, Anarion hasn't had an awful lot to do, outside of being Isildur's very valiant younger brother, but in season 5, Anarion will have to stand on his own two feet. He's now 210 years old, he is a king in his own right, with a son who is going to go on to be very important. Actually, Tolkien tells us that Anarion had four children, but apart from the important one, the others are never named or talked about, and honestly, we don't even know what their genders were. So, because we have so many cool things to focus on in this season, I will kind of sweep those other three under the rug. But the fourth child, the last baby ever to be born on the island of Númenor, his name is Meneldil. And, spoiler alert, it is through Meneldil that all future kings of Gondor will be descended. So, Anarion and Meneldil follow the Great Harad Road into the warm southerly region of Harondor. And Harondor is a land that over the course of the Third Age will go back and forth quite a few times between Gondor and Independent. And by the time of the Lord of the Rings, it's actually deserted. But right now, in the beginning, the wars of the Gondorians and the Haradrim haven't happened yet. And so I imagine Harandor in the Second Age would be a land where different people live together and different cultures mix. Some men of Harandor would be of Dúnedain descent, whose ancestors came from Umba or Pelargir or somewhere else. Others would be pre-Numenorians who journeyed south from the outlands of Gondor, and some would be Haradrim who journeyed up from Far Harad. All these cultures are now connected by Anarion's new Harad road, and I feel like this is a cool opportunity to explore a very interesting part of Middle-earth that doesn't often get explored. However, all is not wonderful in Harondor. And a part of the reason why King Anarion of Gondor has made this journey is to uncover rumours of a shadow that is growing on his southern border. At a great crossroads, Anarion, Meneldil and their company halt, and they await the coming of another royal company up from the south, a king among the Haradrim, flying a banner of a red hawk. And this king among the Haradrim should be a great-grandson from that Haradrim family that I briefly mentioned back in Season 4. The main point of that plotline was simply to establish divisions among the Haradrim, and to show how a single extended family can be utterly sundered by hatred. The Haradrim of the Red Hawk understand that Sauron is the true enemy of all men, and they ally themselves against him. But there are others in Harad who so resented the atrocities of the Black Numenorians that they would rather join with the Dark Lord than make peace with the Dúnedain. These darker-willed Haradrim fly the banner of the Black Serpent. However, the king who comes to meet Anarion at the crossroads he is a great-grandson of the wiser branch of that family. He is the King of the Red Hawk. He doesn't love the men of Numenor, but he does recognise that they are not the enemy many of his people believe them to be. And even if they were, Sauron is still the true enemy. Many of the Haradrim disagree, but the king makes an alliance with Anarion anyway, and he swears to fight with Gondor, should the Dark Lord return, for he is the enemy of all men. 
Now, I'll come back to this Haradrim storyline in a little bit, but let's stick with the Dúnedain for just a little longer and take a look at what's going on with Isildur's wife, Eärendil. I guess the most relevant thing to say about Eärendil right now is that in the year this is taking place, 3429, Isildur's wife would have been pregnant with their final child. And this pregnancy is important. I've already mentioned the elder three sons, Elendur, Aratan, and Kirion, but, spoiler, I guess, none of them are destined to have children of their own. Instead, all of Isildur's heirs in the Third Age will be descendants of this as yet unborn child that Eärendil is currently carrying. Anyway, while Eärendil's husband and her adult sons are off in the White Mountains, she remains in Minas Ithil. And Minas Ithil is a very important location for us to spend some time in. I'm aware that Minas Anor, aka Minas Tirith, is probably the more iconic city, but I definitely do think we need to explore just how amazing Minas Ithil is. And, just so happens, Minas Ithil is described in great detail in The Lord of the Rings. So again, in terms of rights, we have everything we need to follow Tolkien's lead. And what I find so cool about Minas Ithil is its association with the moon and with nighttime. While the moon is out, the city's gleaming marble captures some of its silver light so that the streets and houses of Minas Ithil glow white in the night. And in the central courtyard of this radiant city blossoms the first white tree of Gondor, the tree that grew from the fruit of Nimloth, which Isildur saved from Sauron back in Season 4. And yet, this amazing glowing Tower of the Moon is built into the Mountains of Shadow. This is the same place where Isildur encountered those Sauron-worshipping cultists back in Season 3. He built Minas Ithil here for the express purpose of guarding the Pass of the Spider, and keeping watch over the lands of the seemingly vanquished enemy. Minas Ithil exists because Isildur carries with him the knowledge of the Nazgul, and he knows that despite Numenor's downfall, Sauron is not gone for good. Also, one more very important thing about Minas Ithil, just like Osgiliath and Minas Anor, Isildur city is home to one of the seven Palantiri, the seven seeing stones of the Dúnedain. Anarion has one in Minas Anor, there is a massive one in Osgiliath, there's one in the Numenorean outpost of Orthanc, which will in thousands of years' time become Saruman's, and there are three up north in Arenor, the other great kingdom of the Dúnedain that is ruled by the now 310-year-old High King of all the Dúnedain, Elendil. So, as Eärendil looks into the Palantir of Minas Ithil, we can transition the story over a thousand miles north to the Palantir of her father-in-law up in his capital city, in his kingdom of Arenor. Now, Arenor is another really, really cool part of Tolkien's writings. It's sort of like the northern equivalent of Gondor, but throughout the Third Age, I feel it is quite often overshadowed by its more iconic sister kingdom in the south. However, back at the end of the Second Age, the complete opposite would have been true. Like, Gondor is cool, but it's no Arenor. At this moment in time, Arenor is by far the greatest kingdom of men anywhere in the world. Upon the shores of Lake Nenuial stands Arnor's capital city, Arnuminas. And it is from here that Elendil rules with his queen, Soroniel. 
And another fun fact, over 3,000 years ago, back at the beginning of the Second Age, back in Season 1, Lake Nenuial was one of the key locations where Galadriel and her wandering company dwelt. This lake used to be governed by Galadriel, which is particularly interesting because, remember, Galadriel also dwelt in Belfalos during the Second Age, down in what's now southern Gondor. Thousands of years before the downfall of Numenor, Galadriel was tending to the lands that would one day become both Arnor and Gondor. We don't really have the rights to make a big deal out of that, but it's interesting, and it ties Galadriel tighter into the Dúnedain storyline. Also, speaking of Galadriel and the Dúnedain, there is another super awesome detail that we totally do have the rights to use, and that is the Ring of Barahir, which sits upon Elendil's finger. So, Elendil inherited this ring, along with his First Age sword Narsil and his Silver Scepter of Andunie, from his very distant ancestor Silmarien, firstborn child of the firstborn great-grandson of Elros, Numenor's first king. As we know from Season 3's prologue, Silmarien did not succeed her father the king, because back then only a male heir could rule Numenor. So the ruling scepter of the king passed to Silmarien's younger brother, but Silmarien inherited a silver scepter, which was passed down through her descendants all the way to Elendil. The ruling scepter of Numenor's kings was lost with Arpharazon in the Caves of the Forgotten at the end of last season, but the silver scepter of Silmarien, that was brought to Middle-earth, where it has now become the ruling scepter of the kings of Arnor. It is the very same scepter that Elendil's eventual heir Aragorn will take up when he unites the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor once again at the end of the Third Age. Now, what does that have to do with the Ring of Barahir? Well, this ring was also an heirloom of Silmarians that ended up in Elendil's possession, but the story that this ring represents is such a fundamentally important theme that it basically defines Elendil's characterization throughout Season 5. So, the Ring of Barahir is old. Like, older than any other named ring. Way older than the Rings of Power. It's older than the Sun. And, originally, it belonged to Galadriel's wonderful older brother, Finrod Felagund. But then, Finrod gave this ring to a mortal man called Barahir. And he did so because this ring represented an oath. It was a token of abiding friendship between Finrod and the line of Barahir. In the Lord of the Rings appendices, we are told very little about Finrod Felagund, except Finrod Felagund, friend of men who gave his life to save Beren, son of Barahir. The whole point of Finrod's character in the appendices, the only thing that we have the rights to, is the profundity of the friendship that existed between the best of the elves and the best of men, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, back in the First Age. Finrod did not die hunting Sauron. Vengeance for Finrod is not the point of his relationship with Galadriel. Finrod was a capitalized friend of men. That's his epithet. That's how he's remembered to history. He gave his life to save the life of a man. And that man, Beren, son of Barahir, went on to have two twin grandsons called Elrond and Elros. In that original cold opening of Season 1, where we see Elros and Elrond exploring the themes of death and deathlessness, Elros should give the Ring of Barahir back to the race of elves via his brother Elrond on his deathbed, but Elrond should immediately re-gift it to Elros's firstborn child. 
The whole point of this ring is that it is a gift from elves to men, and it represents thousands of years of friendship between Eldar and Edain. And friendship between Eldar and Edain is exactly what Elendil is all about in Season 5. So in the first few episodes, I think Elendil should ride away from Arnuminas, and he should follow the newly built road southwest from his capital city to the Great White Tower of Elos Tyrion, which stands near the border between Arnor and Lindon, a kingdom of men and a kingdom of elves. In fact, we are told in the Lord of the Rings prologue that these white towers were built specifically for High King Elendil by his friend and neighbour, High King Gilgalad. They are another opportunity to show the profundity of the friendship between these two kingdoms. Elendil climbs the elven tower of Elos Tyrion, and at the very top, he finds Gil-galad waiting for him. There's nothing hugely important to the plot here, but I don't think it's enough just to tell the viewer that these guys are friends. We really need to witness firsthand the relationship that has grown between these two high kings in the 109 years since they met in the final scene of season 4. On the one hand, what we have here is a meeting between the two greatest kings of their respective races, but it's also a coming together of genuine friends, an exploration of what is up there among the most significant friendships ever in the entire history of Middle-earth. And just to explore this theme even further and reintroduce another very important character, the thing that this tower of Elos Tyrion is most famous for is that it's home to the most special of all seven Palantiri in Middle-earth. Whereas the other six are all connected to each other, the stone of Elos Tyrion is entirely separate. It cannot be used to communicate with the other six, instead it had been aligned by Círdan the shipwright to look west. All the way west. Beyond even the straight road that now sunders the uttermost west from the world itself. When Elendil stands on the eastern side of this palantir and he looks directly into it, he sees the undying lands. He is among the only mortals ever to witness it. And even among the elves of Middle-earth, Elos Tyrion is an almost sacred place of pilgrimage. Due to a coming together of Gil-galad's tower, Elendil's palantir, and Círdan's almost divine connection to the lands west of west, something truly wondrous has been achieved a window into the Undying Lands. Also, speaking of Círdan, perhaps the most important thing about his character right now is that he is one of the three guardians of an elvish ring of power. Around his neck, Círdan keeps Narya, the Ring of Fire. And we are told by Tolkien that when Sauron first placed the ruling ring upon his finger almost 2,000 years before this scene, the bearers of the three were immediately aware of him. So I think we could introduce the primary conflict of Season 5 by having Círdan perceive that evil is rising again in the south. The Dark Lord, who's been conspicuously absent for the century following Numenor's downfall, is making ready for war once more. The ruling ring has been used in Mordor. Círdan can feel it. He doesn't know the specifics, and he's way too wise to try and use his ring to learn more. But war is coming. And whatever happens next, this war will bring an end to the Second Age. That's why Gil-galad summoned Elendil to Elos Tyrion, and to the surprise of absolutely no one, 
Ellen Deal should immediately declare his intention to unite his Dunedain with the Noldor when the time for war arrives. Zero hesitation. The last alliance begins in this tower, at this moment, with these high kings, Elendil and Gil-galad. Come what may, they will take on Sauron together. Anyway, there are two more elven ring bearers to talk about, so I will swiftly move on. But just before I leave Ardenor, there's one more interesting detail that I think we could briefly explore with our invented character, Queen Soroniel. We are told by Tolkien that a significant number of the men in Arnor weren't actually exiles of Numenor. Many of them were simply descendants of the middlemen who lived in this part of Middle-earth for millennia before the downfall of Numenor. Distant descendants of the men we met back in seasons 1 and 2. Also, ancestors of the men who will go on to call themselves the Men of Bree. These guys aren't Dúnedain, but they are accepted into the Kingdom of Arnor, and they do become subjects under the protection of Elendil and Soroniel. So perhaps we can show a few scenes depicting Queen Soroniel of Númenor reinforcing and strengthening the bonds between the Dúnedain of Arnor and the middlemen of Arnor. She is uniting cultures, breaking down divisions, and working to ensure that Arnor is a land for all the men who call it home. Perhaps she is the reason why all the men of this land will fight with Elendil in the Last Alliance, despite the fact that some of their ancestors did once worship Sauron. But I don't have time to make up specifics, and Soroniel's a character I invented, so let's journey a few hundred miles east of Arnuminas and take a look at what's happening over in Rivendell with our massively important half-elven ring-bearer, Elrond. In the backgrounds of seasons 3 and 4, I talked about a storyline featuring the re-establishment of an alliance between the Elves of the Northwest and the Dwarves of Durin's Folk. Back in seasons 1 and 2, there was an amazingly prosperous alliance between Celebrimbor of Eregion and Durin III of Khazad Dûm. But then Sauron made war upon the elves, and both Celebrimbor and Durin III were killed. The doors of Durin were shut, and the dwarves of Khazad Dûm sealed themselves away in their mansions beneath the mountains. But that was almost 2,000 years ago. In Season 3, Gil-galad entered Khazad Dûm and became the first outsider to meet with their new king, Durin IV. And in Season 4, it was Elrond of Rivendell who began reforging the friendship that Celebrimbor of Eregion once had with Durin III. So, we should reintroduce Elrond and Durin IV in Season 5 and show a glimpse of what they have spent a hundred years doing since we last saw them. I am imagining a very formal, important meeting, perhaps in Rivendell's Hall of Fire, between Elrond and King Durin IV. And we need to make it very clear that Durin IV, just like his ancestor Durin III, is not just some dwarf. According to the customs of his people, this guy is Durin the Deathless Reborn. He is, sort of, a reincarnation of the original dwarf, a mythological figure, the first of his kind ever to awaken, who was fashioned from the earth by Aule himself, the Maker. It is prophesied that over the span of all Dwarven history, there shall be only seven Durins, and after the last one dies, the race of Dwarves will disappear from the world. So my point is this, Durin the Fourth is an incredibly big deal, and just like Elrond, he is the bearer of a Ring of Power, one of the seven. However, unlike Elrond, Durin the Fourth wears his ring upon his finger. He claims that Sauron's malice has no effect on him, 
And to be fair, it would at least appear that way. He is an astoundingly wealthy and powerful super dwarf, the greatest of his kind to be born in 2000 years, and he is the king of Khazad Doom in its prime. As ring bearers, both Durin the Fourth and Elrond would probably have perceived the same growing darkness that Círdan picked up on, and so they are also both thinking that the Dark Lord's return is imminent. If there were ever a time where an alliance between elves and dwarves would be crucial, it's now. But Khazad Doom has spent almost 2,000 years with its doors shut. Only in the past 100 years has any dwarf of Khazad Doom had any contact with someone who wasn't one of their own. And although from Elrond's perspective, the alliance of Celebrimbor and Durin III was something that he remembers well, from a dwarvish perspective, those days of shared prosperity between elves and men are now ancient history. And what's best remembered of that history in Khazad Doom is that the beloved King Durin III was slain in a war which the elves brought to his doorstep. Once again, we are fundamentally exploring the difference between mortal and immortal perspectives, death and deathlessness. Anyway, although I imagine that Elrond and Durin IV would have a lot of mutual respect for one another, I can't imagine that their friendship would be a particularly easy one. Like, it's so formal, it's so big picture. But in the next Rivendell scene, I think we need to see something far more personal and much more character driven. So in the gardens of Imladris, beneath a full moon, Elrond comes to hang out with his new best friend, a young-ish dwarf who I have invented for the story and decided to name Flowey after a dwarf that Gandalf briefly mentions in the book of Mazarbul. And the reason that I want to include this Flowey character is mainly for the sake of not just retreading the same storylines from season 1 and 2. We already spent plenty of time exploring the idea of a chosen dwarf, you know, Durin the Deathless Reborn. That was the whole point of Durin the Third's character. And so in season 5, I would like to introduce a different perspective on that same thing. A story of Durin, but from the point of view of the dwarf who wasn't chosen. Because, surely, right, for every new Durin born among the dwarves, there must also be a son of Durin who isn't the chosen one. A prince who lives in the shadow of their mythologically profound father, knowing that whatever they do, they will never be Durin. This is what I'm imagining for Prince Flowey, son of Durin IV. There's absolutely nothing wrong with him, I'm not suggesting that he should be incompetent or anything like that. It's just that compared to his super dwarf father, Flowey is a not quite so special prince. And the reason I'm saying all this is because I think there's potential for something really lovely here. Because for a guy like Flowey, there really is no one in all of Middle-earth who could understand what it might be like to have your father be the most mythologically significant figure among your entire race of people. Who else could know how that feels? Well, Elrond, son of Eärendil, son of the guy who turned into a star and brought the First Age to an end, in so doing becoming one of the most celebrated figures within all elvish traditions. I imagine Flowey and Elrond having this very specific thing in common and really bonding on a genuine personal level because of it. And if Flowey is a little bit atypical among other dwarves, if he has a slightly more elvish perspective and a desire to learn about the world beyond the confines of Khazad Doom, then we can develop a really rich relationship between these characters. Flowey has spent decades living as Elrond's guest in Imladris, and in that time he has learned a lot of the way of elves and simultaneously taught Elrond much dwarvish lore from Khazad Doom. I've always found it fascinating how in The Hobbit, Elrond has a deeper knowledge of dwarvish moon letters than either Thorin or Gandalf. 
And it is Elrond who discovers the secrets of Thor's map. Perhaps we can imagine that it was during this invented friendship with Flowey that Elrond learned so much about the customs of Durin's folk that we will see him showcase in 3000 years time. In season 5 we see two sides to Elrond's character. On the one hand he is the Lord of Imladris, bearer of Viliar, the Ring of Air. He is Gil-galad's vice-regent in charge of reforging an alliance with King Durin IV. But on the other hand he's just a wise, kind, delightful friend to his buddy Flowey. His relationship with Durin IV is what's driving the plot forward but it's his friendship with Prince Flowey that's at the heart of his character. Anyway, I will of course come back to this storyline when things get going, but before I do, there's still one more ring bearer to introduce. So let's hop over to the other side of the Misty Mountains and take a look at where Galadriel, Celeborn and Celebrion are hanging out in the beginning of Season 5. However, first thing to say about Galadriel in Season 5 is that Tolkien never mentioned her in his admittedly very limited writings concerning the War of the Last Alliance. So everything Galadriel does in this season is going to have to be invented. Which means, as always, I'm going to try and ensure that these inventions are drawn out of Tolkien's writings instead of projected onto them. As I mentioned in the Season 1 video, Galadriel's character arc throughout the Second Age should be all about her growth into that otherworldly power that we all know and love from The Lord of the Rings. In the First Age there was Melian the Maia, divine queen of a magically guarded woodland realm. In the Third Age, Melian's pupil, Galadriel, basically becomes Melian II. Seasons 1, 2 and 5 of the show need to tell the story of how that happens. In seasons 1 and 2, Galadriel was all about trying to navigate balance between her wisdom and her pride. Through the war with Sauron and the forging of the rings, she was tested, and as a result her ambitions changed from ruling her own great realm as an all-powerful queen of light to being a guardian over people less powerful than herself and protecting her ring of power. Before she departed to the north, she was given a box of Malorn seeds and she was tasked with finding a place in Middle-earth where they might one day grow. It is her destiny to take a small part of Middle-earth and turn it into something that captures the splendour of the Eldar days and the uttermost west. The last time we saw Galadriel in season 4, she was dwelling in the lands that are now part of Gondor, but the Malorn seeds remained unplanted, almost as if Galadriel knew that one day she would yield these southern lands to the heirs of Numenor. But season 4 was 109 years ago, and now in season 5 we see the final chapter of Galadriel's Second Age story. So we should begin with her in a golden wood. All around her is a grove of young Melian trees, and around her neck is a ring of power. Melian is a plural of Malorn, by the way. Galadriel loves these young trees and she tends to each one of them with great care. However, this grove of gold and silver is not yet quite Lothlorien. It's in the place that will one day become Karas Galadon, the city of Galadriel and Celeborn. In the Third Age, this will be the heart of Lothlorien. But right now, it's just a grove of young Melian trees deep inside a golden wood. And it is where Galadriel and Celeborn have chosen to settle. But I do need to point out that this part of Middle-earth should look really quite a bit different from how it looks on Third Age maps. During the Third Age's 3000 years, much of Rovanion's great forests were felled by the local woodsmen. But back in the day, Fangorn and Lothlorien were probably the same forest. 
Greenwood the Great was considerably larger, and potentially all these woods were connected. Northeastern Middle Earth used to be one huge forest, and in addition to Galadriel and Celeborn, this massive Second Age woodland is home to a few other really cool characters. In Season 1, I mentioned three princes of the Sindar, who had all once been kinsmen of the First Age High King of the Sindar, Thingol of Doriath. The eldest and wisest of these three Sindarin princes is Celeborn, husband of Galadriel. The youngest of these princes is Thranduil, future father of Legolas. And the middle prince is a character that I've invented and called Galathorn. The reason Galathorn exists is simply because we don't have the rights to the names Orifer or Amdir or Malgalad, but we can still explore a very similar story to the one told in Unfinished Tales with all the same emotional beats. We'll just have to do it with this Galathorn guy instead. A king among the Sindar. And what Galathorn and Thranduil have been doing during the 1600 years since Season 2 is basically going native. When we first met them, they were Sindar princes living in a Noldorine kingdom. Now they are kings in their own right, but kings of the woodland. Sindarin rulers of a sylvan population, they've turned into pretty quintessential wood elves. Both Galathorn and Thranduil readily adopted the practices and the customs of their Sylvan Galathrim subjects, and by Season 5 they embody much more of a woodland vibe than Celeborn's silvery Sindar Starlight vibe. As I say, they've gone native. And we don't need to spend too much time here, they are not the most important characters of Season 5, but they do have a role in this story. And I think the most efficient way to introduce that is to show us where the woodland kingdoms of Galathorn and Thranduil come together. In The Hobbit, we learn that Thranduil rules Mirkwood from his halls way up in the north. But back in the Second Age, the capital of the Greenwood was actually right in the south. Thranduil's capital is here. The same stronghold that will, in the Third Age, be conquered and corrupted into Dol Guladur. Galathorn's kingdom, on the other hand, lies just to the west of Thranduil's capital, and the boundary between the two woodland kingdoms, the thing that separates Thranduil's realm from Galathorn's, is the River Anduin. However, I'm imagining that at this time in history, there would be a great woodland bridge across the Anduin, right at the point where these two elvish realms meet. It is another invention, Tolkien never mentioned such a bridge, but I'm kind of picturing, you know, like a fantasy version of one of those living tree bridges that's grown instead of built. And there's a few reasons that I mention it, again, I'll come back to it a little bit later, but right now, it's a visual representation of how connected the Woodland Elves in the Second Age are, and how different that is from the isolationist Galadhrim that we meet in the Third Age. And it also provides a convenient location for Galadriel and Celeborn to meet with their former followers turned kings, Galathorn and Thranduil. Just like her fellow ringbearers Círdan and Elrond, Galadriel has also perceived that a shadow is stirring once again in Mordor. Their century of peace is coming to an end, and if the Elves of the East do not unite, they will fall to the power of Sauron. But Galathorn shouldn't take Galadriel's warning particularly seriously. The characters that he's inspired by did not have a particularly positive relationship with the Noldor, and they have a rather unhealthy relationship with pride. Galathorn has spent millennia growing into a mighty woodland king. He comes across as a very powerful figure with an elvish kingdom at his beck and call, and Galadriel doesn't. She is not a queen. Celeborn is not a king. They have no realm aside from their grove of Malorn trees within Galathorn's golden wood, and yet, when Galadriel speaks 
to Galathorn and Thranduil, there can be no doubt which one of them holds the more profound type of power. Galathorn and Thranduil have armies, but Galadriel is well on her way to becoming the next Melian. Her ambition has now given way to wisdom. She wields magic that they cannot conceive of, and although there are loads of powerful elves in Middle-earth, there is only one Galadriel. However, during this scene, Galadriel's daughter, Celebrian, is conspicuously absent. She and the rest of her parents' wandering company chose not to settle among Galadriel's grove of Malon trees, and instead they are dwelling just to the south of the Greenwood, in a place where the forest has given way to gardens. A place that I will call the Greenlands. And these green lands are absolutely stunning. On the eastern bank of the river Anduin, we see fruit flourishing on branches, meadows painted with flowers, great gardens in full blossom. For close to a century, these green lands of plenty have been home to Celebrian and a number of the younger elves from her parents' wandering company. However, elves are not the reason that these gardens are so bountiful and wonderful. According to writings found in The Lord of the Rings, this part of the world is, at the end of the Second Age, home to the gardens of the Entwives. I have been wanting to talk about Entwives since the first episode of this series, and now I finally can! Now they matter to the overarching plot. Only one Entwife is ever named by Tolkien, but luckily, from a lore perspective, she would be the one that I would choose to focus on. Fimbrethil, one of the oldest and loveliest of all the Entwives, wife of Fangorn, aka Treebeard, and the closest thing that these green lands have to a leader. I imagine Fimbrethil and Celebrian would have a delightfully wholesome friendship. They are two of the loveliest characters in the whole show, but for that reason, I am going to move on from them quite swiftly. Conflict is the engine of storytelling, and there is simply no conflict in the Gardens of the Entwives. The purpose of this scene is simply to demonstrate that at this point in the story, this, right here, is the nicest place in all of Middle-earth. Which is why it will contrast so diametrically with the worst place in Middle-earth. 100 miles to the south of the Greenlands lies the Black Land of Morador. We've heard a lot of talk about what Sauron's been getting up to, but now we're gonna need to see it. As we transition over to Morador, the first two things that we should see are the one ring upon Sauron's finger, and before him, the colossal tower of Barad-dûr, by far the tallest tower in all of Middle-earth. Barad-dûr is a monument to Sauron's pride, and his arrogance, and his dominion. Barad-dûr is not just a building, it is fashioned in part by the power of the One Ring. There's a reason that Barad-dûr crumbles when the ring is destroyed, and I think in this moment we need to see why that is the case. Barad-dûr is ludicrously humongous, and its foundations are so purely evil that no technology could build it. It is the power of the ring that keeps Barad-dûr standing, and it is because of the ring that the Dark Tower is unlike anything else left in Arida. But then we should get our first clear look at Season 5 Sauron. 
And as has been the case with every previous season, now Sauron has a new look. And season 5 Sauron is unlike any of his previous incarnations, he could not be more different from the Lord of Gifts back in season 1, he has risen and then subsequently fallen so far that the character we met back in the cold opening is almost unrecognisable from what he's now become. We know that after the downfall of Numenor, Sauron lost his ability to adopt a fair form. His physical body now reflects the ugliness and the cruelty and the malice that boils inside him, and it is finite. If it is slain, his naked spirit will have no way of interacting with the seen world. His greatest assets, his deception, his guile, his charm, they are all gone now. Taking down Numenor came at a massive cost, and in the 100 years since season 4, Sauron has changed. He's more hateful now, he's more desperate, and he's even more dangerous. After a century of rebuilding his strength in secret, Sauron is now ready for his final war. The decisive conflict for the fate of the next age. And considering that building alliances is such a massive part of the first half of season 5, I think we should have at least one scene examining the other side of that, the forging of Sauron's alliances. Tolkien told us that no elves ever fought for Mordor and no orcs ever fought for the alliance, but among the other races of men, dwarves, birds and beasts, there were at least some who fought on both sides. So I think it would be cool to introduce two new kindreds of dwarves, from far away to the east and south, led by two dwarven chieftains who bear two of the seven dwarven rings of power. But these dwarves serve Sauron. They swear loyalty to Mordor upon their rings, and in exchange they are promised a reward of limitless gold and uncounted wealth after the Dark Lord's final victory. Also, I think there's an opportunity to briefly show the corruption of some men in parts of the world that Sauron occupies. The second in command of the Nazgul was once a chieftain of the Easterlings, and there are two besides the Witch King who were once lords of Numenor. So perhaps we can see the Easterling Nazgul journey off into Rune, where he successfully recruits a bunch of warlords to serve Sauron and overthrow the rightful leaders of the East, whilst in the South the former Numenorian Nazgul journey into Harad and potentially manipulate the other half of that Haradrim royal family who despise the Dúnedain enough to join forces with Sauron the men of the Black Serpent. However, the Lord of the Nazgul and the other five Ringwraiths, they do not go abroad as messengers, their skill set is saved for another task. You see, it is the Wraith who will one day be known as the Witch King that Sauron uses as the weapon with which to land his first blow, his first strike, the opening gambit of the War of the Last Alliance, the point of no return. Which brings us all the way back to Minas Ithil, the Tower of Isildur. This is where it all begins. On a chill night, without moon, when the silver lights of Minas Ithil are at their dimmest, a dreadful sound echoes down from the mountains of shadow, the screech of a Nazgul. Terror grips the city. From the dark pass of the spider emerge the wraiths of Sauron. They stand before the eastern wall of the city and their presence is like a nightmare descending upon the Dúnedain. Then, when all-consuming fear has truly set in, there comes a flood of orcs, teeming out of the night like ants out of a nest. 
Isildur and his three sons lead the defense of the East Gate, but against the power of the Nazgul and the sudden onslaught of orcs, they cannot win. The Nazgul's black breath overpowers Isildur's defenders, and once the orcs have scaled the walls and broken inside the Tower of the Moon, it is the beginning of the end. Whilst Isildur holds back the unending legions, his pregnant wife Aarien oversees the escape of their people. It's no longer about winning, it's about surviving. By the time the sun rises behind the mountains of shadow and day finally comes again, the Tower of the Moon has fallen. The city of Isildur now belongs to the Lord of the Nazgul. And not for the last time, Minas Ithil is corrupted into Minas Morgul, the Tower of Dark Sorcery. However, in the final moments of the fighting, as the Nazgul sweep inside the city and all is lost, Isildur cuts from his white tree a seedling, just like he did 100 years ago by stealing the last fruit of Numenor's white tree, Nimloth, Isildur saves a scion of this tree. He ensures that the hope of the Dúnedain shall not be conquered with his city. Nevertheless though, this is a massive defeat for our heroes. Sauron's orcs burn Gondor's first white tree, Minas Ithil's silver radiance turns into what Tolkien called a corpse light, which illuminates nothing. And, perhaps most significantly, Isildur's Palantir falls into the possession of the Dark Lord which means the other five Palantiri that connect to it are no longer safe to use. The Dúnedain can no longer communicate via Palantir without the Nazgûl looking in. So, Isildur and Aarien lead the survivors of Minas Ithil to the capital of Osgiliath, and here they are reinforced and protected by a great host of Anarion strength that have come out of Minas Anor. Gondor is now at war, and Eastern Osgiliath has become the front line. Messengers are immediately sent to Isildur and Anarion's supposed allies in the White Mountains and Harad, but when night falls again, the men of Osgiliath hear the screech of the Nazgul once more. However, last time the Gondorians were caught unawares, this time they're not. And although Osgiliath is famously a ruin at the time of the Lord of the Rings, back at the end of the Second Age, Osgiliath is a pretty unconquerable capital of the Dúnedain. It is a legacy of Númenor, and fun fact, the reason that Osgiliath is a ruin at the time of the Lord of the Rings is because it was destroyed during a civil war. Just like Númenor, the only thing that can take down Gondor's capital is Gondorians. But anyway, that is 1,400 years in the future. Right now, even the Nazgul cannot crack Osgiliath. Trouble is though, they're not really trying to. Every night they emerge from the blackness and fear descends on the city, Orcs swarm the walls, and although each and every one is slain, and a thousand orc corpses are made visible by each rising of the sun, when the sun sets again, the orcs return, and with them come the Nazgul and the terror that they inspire with their presence. Perhaps sometimes Gondorian riders can charge out from Osgiliath to hunt the orcs by daylight, but when night falls the orcs always come back and any riders who don't return by sunset are never seen again. Until one night, at the hour before dawn, a great thunder of hooves is heard riding up the Harad Road and through Ithilien. As the sun rises, Haradrim warriors descend upon the orcs, and as they charge into their ranks, Isildur, Anarion, and their cavalry join them in battle. Between the alliance of Gondor and Harad, every orc is slaughtered. The Nazgul flee, and the nightly attacks on Osgiliath 
cease. Sauron's servants head north, up the eastern banks of the Anduin. Anyway, the guy who led these Haradrim warriors to Gondor's aid is, of course, the King of the Red Hawk. The guy who swore an oath of friendship to Anarion. But this king's distant cousin, the Sauron supporter who represents a much darker side of Haradrim society, he has also ridden to war and also fought in this battle, under the banner of the Black Serpent. Which means there are now two very different types of Haradrim up in Osgiliath with the kings of Gondor. However, whereas the men of Harad did come to the war when called upon, they fulfilled their oath, the men of the White Mountains did not. They only come to Askeliath long after the fighting is over. And so although they haven't quite broken their oath yet, they certainly did not fulfill it. Their king can flippantly, you know, swear an oath again to Isildur as a means of acquiring more gold and weapons, but Isildur is not happy. If the men of the White Mountains do not come the next time they are called, they shall be deemed oath breakers. They shall be unable to depart the circles of the world until their oath is fulfilled. Dead, yet unable to die, they will be cursed with deathlessness. Anyway, I imagine Isildur and Anarion would ride back to Minas Ithil as soon as they're able, but when they return, they find that the land has been defiled, the waters polluted, the meadows are sick and pale, and poisonous fumes rise from the Mordegul Vale. So long as the Nazgul inhabit it, Minas Mordegul cannot be retaken. Which means the Palantiri are still compromised. Without the Seeing Stones of Numenor, the men of Gondor are going to have to send word to Elendil up in Arnor the old-fashioned way. So, the kings of Gondor decide that Anarion should stay in Osgiliath with his son Meneldil and their new allies from Harad, while Isildur should sail with Earien and their three sons up north to the Grey Havens, where they will then ride swiftly to their father in Arnumenas, with news that the war they've been fearing has now begun. Gondor must have reinforcements from its allies, or it will fall. Isildur and his company depart Osgiliath by ship, they head south towards the sea, and Anarion and his family take the reins of ruling Gondor. But Sauron's attack on Osgiliath that was only his opening move, and it wasn't ever actually his plan to destroy Gondor in this moment. That will come later. Instead, the conquest of Minas Ithil was simply a tactic to force the eyes of his enemies towards their own borders. To keep the eyes of the Dúnedain away from the north. Because it is just to the north that Sauron intends to deliver his second blow. And this will be far more brutal than the first. So, as the orcs flee north along the river Anduin, the Black Gate of Mordor opens, and from the Dark Land emerges Sauron arrayed for war to lead this attack in person. And the reason I think it's so important to have Sauron take a direct role in this moment is because what's about to happen is, in my mind, the worst thing that Sauron ever does. And I am aware how huge of a statement that is. This next scene isn't really about moving the plot forward, it's a showcase of how desperately abhorrent the Dark Lord has now become. This needs to be the most harrowing scene in all five seasons. I'm well aware that last season had a heavy focus on human sacrifice, but this is even darker than that. Morally speaking, this is Sauron's lowest low. One of his cruelest deeds, the burning of the gardens of the Entwives. So, in Lord of the Rings, we are told that this vast area of land that I've been calling the Greenlands 
was, during the War of the Last Alliance, absolutely burned to ash by Sauron. We'll see the heat of Sauron's hand being used as a weapon towards the end of this season, and this seems like a good place to establish that heat and fire have replaced deception and guile as the weapons of the Dark Lord. Augmented by the power of the One Ring upon his finger, Sauron walks into the heart of the Entwives' garden. Perhaps he can come face to face with Fimbrathil herself, and then, without warning, or parley, or any hint of honour, Sauron summons an evil flame that destroys everything. The Entwives are burned alive, their gardens wither, their green lands are consumed, and when the fire of Sauron's inferno turns to plumes of black smoke, all that's left of the most beautiful place in all of Middle-earth is a desert of dust. This place shall forever afterwards be known as the Brownlands. And even 3,000 years later, when the Fellowship journey down the River Anduin after leaving Lothlorien, they will pass a vast desolation on the eastern bank of the river that Tolkien describes as formless slopes stretching up. Brown and withered they looked, as if fire had passed over them, leaving no living blade of green. An unfriendly waste without even a broken tree. After Sauron comes to these gardens, the land is destroyed beyond recovery. He has ensured that if any enemy ever descends upon Mordor from the north, they will have nothing but miles of ash to march through. And, of course, after this, no Entwives are ever seen again. They are lost. Treebeard holds on to hope that some may still be living somewhere, but honestly, I fear that this is wishful thinking. All the evidence suggests that the Entwives were incinerated in their own gardens by Sauron at the beginning of this war, or, potentially worse, enslaved. Maybe we can leave a little bit of ambiguity, perhaps an Entwife can be seen fleeing east, but I think we need to see the rest of them die. We need to know just how hateful and awful Sauron has become. Because I really don't think that Season 1 Sauron would have done this. He would certainly have tried taking dominion over the Entwives' gardens, but I think he would have done so through manipulation and with a fair form. But he can't do that anymore. Deception is no longer his weapon. All Sauron has now to wield is hatred and malice and the heat of his hand. So, along with the Entwives, I imagine that many of the Woodland Elves who lived in this region would also be burned alive. But there has to be at least a few survivors, and the one who gathers these survivors and takes charge in guiding them away from the devastation should be Celebrion. She has just watched her friends die, her home burn, and her innocence turn to cinders. But just like her mother, Celebrion now has no choice but to become a guardian for her people. She leads the weak, weary, and wounded elves away from the smouldering brownlands, through the smoke, over scorched earth, and up to the woodland bridge of the Galadhrim, where she'll be reunited with her parents, Galadriel and Celeborn. When Celebrion tells of the genocide of the Entwives, both Galadriel and Celeborn understand the magnitude of what this means. The Second Age is ending. The war for everything to come has already begun. So, the time has come for this family to split up. They each have a task to do, 
and a journey to undertake. As the mightiest prince of the Sindar, it is up to Celeborn to unite the Elves of the East, the Sindar and Sylvan of the Woodlands, the Galadhrim, who have lived peacefully in their woods for one and a half thousand years, but now that peace must come to an end. The wider world cannot forever be fenced out. So, Celeborn is the viewpoint character through which I think we should explore the role of Thranduil's Woodland Army in the North and the Sylvan Army of the Golden Wood. The Galadhrim, who will join the Last Alliance and then later, in the Third Age, become known as the Wood Elves of Mirkwood and Lothlorien. However, Galadriel would, I think, be wasted in this storyline. While her husband is finding balance between Sindar and Sylvan Elves, Galadriel should head north up into the wilds of Rovanion, in search of a very, very old friend slash, potentially, if you think about it, former foe. As I've already said, everything Galadriel does this season has to be entirely invented. There is no faithful way to feature her in Season 5, yet I think it would be a real shame to sideline her. And there is a blink-and-you-miss-it detail about the War of the Last Alliance that I not only find fascinating to ponder, but I also think is a great opportunity to explore the culmination of Galadriel's character arc, while simultaneously keeping her relevant to the plot. Tolkien tells us that the last alliance comprised of elves, men, dwarves, birds, and beasts. But apart from the elves, there were also some from each race who fought against the alliance, in service of Sauron. We've had plenty of focus so far on elves and men and dwarves, but I would really like to feature a storyline that introduces the birds and beasts of the Last Alliance, and I think Galadriel is a worthy character to serve as a point of view for that side plot. So, she travels north alone, through the wilds of Ravanion between the Misty Mountains and the River Anduin. She crosses the Gladden Fields, which we'll see again in the final episode, and eventually she comes to the Great Stone that will, by the time of The Hobbit, be known as the Karok. And in The Hobbit, the guy who came up with the name Karok is Bayorn, the Skin Changer. Now, this is taking place almost 3,000 years before The Hobbit, so I'm definitely not suggesting that Bayorn should be, like, alive at this time, but I do feel there's good inspiration here that can be used to explore the birds and beasts of Season 5. I guess we don't need to be too creative to suggest that the beasts who fought for Sauron would have included wargs and werewolves, and yes, we do have the rights to werewolves thanks to Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. Although I should point out that Tolkien's werewolves are not shapeshifters, they're just giant evil wolves inhabited by an evil spirit. Anyway, I would suggest that wargs and werewolves represent the beasts of Sauron, but the ancestors of Bayorn's people could perhaps be the face of the beasts who fight for the Alliance. We know from The Hobbit that the gigantic black bears of Rovanion are particular enemies of the evil wolves. And so I'm imagining Galadriel journeying to meet with a tribe of these bears, and convincing them to aid her in the final war of the age. I don't want to lean too hard on the whole Bayorn thing, he is his own character, living millennia after this story takes place. And also, I actually think these bears might be more interesting if we don't see them change shape. They are, for all intents and purposes, just giant wild bears, but they understand Galadriel's speech, and they have a language of their own. And although every member of the tribe is a giant bear, perhaps they could care for babies that are of the race of men. This is a place where the line between bear and person is blurred, and in 3,000 years this blurred line will lead to the Bayornings of the late Third Age. However, as much as I do enjoy bears and Bayorn, they are not the only reason Galadriel journeyed all this way. After successfully making some new friends, she heads off towards the Misty Mountains, and climbs up towards the eerie of the Great Windlord. Gwaihir. 
Now, Guai here is obviously a fan favorite character, but again, I think there should be more to his interactions with Galadriel than simply fan service. Back in season four, we established that the great eagles are witnesses of the Valar, and we know from the appendices that Galadriel and the Noldor left Valinor against the will of the Valar back in the first age. So although we don't have the rights to the Silmarillion specifics, we do have everything we need to portray a pretty interesting relationship between these two characters, Gwaihir and Galadriel. Back in the Eldar days, during the time of Morgoth, Gwaihir and his eagles were sent to Middle-earth as witnesses of the Valar, while Galadriel came with the Noldor as rebels against the Valar. Back in the deeps of time, Gwaihir and Galadriel both came to Middle-earth at the same time as part of the same event, but on very different sides. Now that conflict's been over for 3,000 years and most vestiges of that ancient time are gone, but Galadriel and Gwaihir remain, relics of the First Age still going strong at the end of the Second Age. However, both these characters definitely have the wisdom to recognize that regardless of how they first came to Middle-earth, they are on the same side now. We do not need to manufacture conflict between these good guys. There are way cooler things to explore because, of course, there are birds and beasts on both sides of this war. And in The Return of the King, Tolkien uses some very interesting language to describe the winged steeds used by the Nazgûl, the fell beasts. These creatures are often portrayed in adaptations as looking like some kind of a dragon, but Tolkien's language makes it sound very much more like they're a type of featherless bird, or perhaps even like some fantasy version of a pterosaur. Tolkien describes a creature of an older world, maybe it was, whose kind, lingering in forgotten mountains cold, outstayed their day and in hideous, eerie bred this last untimely brood. The Dark Lord took it and nursed it with fell meats until it grew beyond the measure of all other things that fly." Now that specific language is in reference to the Witch King's steed during the Battle of Pelennor Fields, but it hints at a much older type of winged evil that could have served Sauron in the Second Age. And whatever those things were, surely only Gwaihir and the other great eagles could challenge its mastery of the skies. Anyway, whilst all of this is happening with Galadriel, her daughter Celebrion's storyline is much more intimately bound to the main plot of Season 5. She leads what remains of her wandering company up the Silverlode River towards the valley that is known amongst the elves as Nandu Hirion, among men as the Dimril Dale, and among dwarves as Azanulbizar. It is here that the East Gate of Khazad Doom can be found. Just as Celebrion did multiple times throughout seasons one and two, she passes beneath the Misty Mountains and follows the dwarf road of Khazad Doom all the way to the doors of Durin on the west side of the mountains. As she does, she learns that King Durin IV and his son, Prince Flowey, are currently up in Imladris, forming an alliance with the elven lord who lives there. And so, Celebrian leads her people all the way up to Rivendell, and here she finally gets to spend some time with her future husband, Elrond. So I'll come back to Rivendell in just a minute, but at around the same time Celebrian comes to Elrond with news of Sauron's devastating attack, about 200 leagues to the west, Isildur and his family arrive at the Grey Havens with terrible news of their own. Isildur's ship is met by Círdan at the Grey Havens, and when Isildur explains to High King Gil-galad that Sauron has unleashed war upon Gondor, the last alliance begins to take shape. And this really is what Gil-galad's character arc has been building to throughout the entire story. 
In season one, he was a relatively young warrior king, obsessed with eradicating any and all evil from his newly founded kingdom. In season two, he proved his prowess as a warrior. He fought beside Numenorians and prevented Sauron from conquering Lindon, but it was a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. And though Sauron lost the war, he did end up winning the peace. So, during seasons three and four, Gil-galad put down his great spear Iagloss, and he transitioned from a warrior king of Lindon into the far-sighted commander of all Sauron's enemies. He began building alliances, first with Durin the Fourth, then with Elendil. And so, in season five, Gil-galad must take up Iagloss again. He must embody the warrior king of seasons one and two again. He must finish what he started back in the War of the Elves and Sauron, but now he is enriched with the wisdom of 2,700 years. Now, Gil-galad has an alliance. As we enter the second half of Season 5, we should begin an episode with Gil-galad in Lindon. He's putting on his silver mail. He's sharpening the blade of Iagloss. Círdan is with him, arrayed for war. Beneath a starry night sky, the elves of Lindon gather before their High King as an army ready for battle. Isildur, Earien, and their three sons are with Círdan, and they are all watching Gil-galad intently. After some kind of epic speech, probably, Gil-galad rides east, away from his capital, and the entire host of the Noldor rides with him. A great army of High Elves ride out from Lindon towards a war from which many will never return. Gil-galad himself is leaving Lindon for the final time. He rides beneath the stars towards the sunrise. And as day comes, we see Elendil standing upon a great hill, looking west towards the coming of Gil-galad, Isildur, and the elven army. And this scene is taken straight out of Fellowship of the Ring. In the chapter A Knife in the Dark, we are told that this place where Elendil stood and awaited the coming of Gil-galad and the Alliance was none other than the great Dúnedain watchtower of Amon Sul, which will in later days be known as Weathertop. At Weathertop, Elendil's Manish army of Arnor unites with the Elvish army of Lindon, and the two High Kings ride with their armies together along the Great East Road, over the last bridge, across the ford of Bruinen, and down into the valley of Imladris. Which means most of our main characters are now all in one location. Rivendell, where we have a great opportunity to showcase <laughs> many meetings, many different interactions between characters who have not met before. For example, Círdan the Shipwright and Prince Floey of khazad Not a natural pairing, but I imagine these two would have a lot of interesting things to say to each other. However, the most important of all these many meetings is definitely the one between the show's two kind of main protagonists, Isildur and Elrond. We absolutely have to spend a good chunk of time growing the friendship between these two. Their relationship is simultaneously a climax to the whole Elrond and Elros relationship that began our whole story. Don't forget, Isildur is a direct descendant of Elrond's twin brother, but this friendship will also go on to define a massive part of the Third Age. The whole Elrond, Aragorn, Arwen thing, the whole heirs of Isildur being raised in Rivendell thing, that begins with this friendship between Elrond and Isildur. And this friendship can trace its origins all the way back to season three, when Elrond spent years hanging out with Isildur's now wife, Earien. 
And I guess the first thing that Elrond would notice upon seeing Aardian again would be that by now she is heavily pregnant. We are actually told that Isildur and his wife have their fourth child in the very same year as the founding of the Last Alliance. And I think it would be really nice to contrast the impending doom of war with new life being born in Rivendell. The fourth born child of Isildur is another son called Valandil. And although he's only a baby right now, from a lore perspective Valandil is a really important character. As another heir of Elendil's, I imagine the birth of Valandil would be considered an auspicious omen among the Dúnedain. It's a moment of down-to-earth human happiness nestled amid a pretty epic tragedy. Anyway, for plot reasons as well as character reasons, I reckon Elrond should be the one to tend to Aardian as she recovers from childbirth, and he should be there with Isildur when he holds his son for the first time. From Elrond's deathless perspective, he is Valandil's uncle, just 25 generations removed. Seriously, I cannot overstate the significance of Elrond's friendship with the Numenorean royal family. It kind of really is what the whole five seasons of this story have been about. But there's a lot more to talk about, so I will briefly move on to Elrond's blossoming friendship slash potential romance with Celebrion. I am not suggesting that season 5 should pivot into a rom-com. The romance of Elrond and Celebrion is irrelevant to the story at hand. They won't actually get married or have any children until the third age, but their relationship is worth introducing, I think. They've both been present since the very beginning of season 1, and back then they were both very young elves. Now they're not. Celebrion has just undergone a harrowing trauma, but Elrond is a healer and Rivendell is a place of peace. Together, they bond, they share their joys and their sorrows, and they celebrate the new life of Valandil. Rivendell becomes a new home for Celebrion. Also, while Elrond is building his friendship with Isildur, I think there is a neat possibility for Celebrion to build a friendship with Aardian. Back in Season 3, Aardian did the exact same journey that Celebrion's just done, but in reverse. While travelling down the river Anduin, Aardian also spent time among the Entwives, and so I imagine that learning of their fiery demise from Celebrion would be pretty heartbreaking for Aardian. And yet, from sorrow comes pity and kindness and sympathy. That is a theme that Tolkien wove into all of his writings. Perhaps by grieving the Entwives together, Aardian and Celebrion can reinforce the other side of that Isildur-Elrond friendship. And while we're on the topic of Celebrion, eventually her mother Galadriel should also come to Imladris, perhaps upon the back of a great eagle. And I think there's a very important meeting that needs to be shown between Galadriel, Elrond, and Elendil, a scene to tie up some of the themes that were explored back in Season 1 regarding Galadriel and her brother Finrod Felagund. Back in Season 3, Galadriel met Isildur and Anarion, and in Season 4 she met them again when they washed up on the shores of what's now called Gondor, but she's never met Elendil before, and it is Elendil who wears the Ring of Barahir the ring that he inherited from Elros, Numenor's first king. But, as I've mentioned, back in the First Age, this ring was originally gifted to a mortal ancestor of Elros's, called Barahir, by Galadriel's brother, friend of men, Finrod Felagund. He was the original owner of this ring. He gifted it to the mortal Barahir as a token of abiding friendship before he gave up his life to save the son of Barahir, Beren. So this ring means three very different things to these three different characters. And the three perspectives of Elendil, Elrond, and Galadriel illuminate an important through-line of Middle-earth's backstory. 
Ellen Deal sees the Ring of Barahir as a symbol of his descent from Silmarion. It is an heirloom of the faithful. Elrond, however, he sees it as a token of friendship between him and all Numenorians throughout the entire Second Age, but Galadriel, she sees it as an even more ancient token of friendship between her brother and the entire race of men going back into the deeps of the First Age. The alliance that's forming right now in Imladris has roots that go back to the Eldar days, and the Ring of Barahir is proof of what Frodo says in the Two Towers. The great tales never end. The people in them come and go when their parts are finished, but this is all one massive story. From Finrod and Barahir in the First Age, to the Elves and Numenorians of the Second Age, to Aragorn and Arwen of the Third Age, it's all the same tale. The Great Stories Never End is another one of those central themes of Tolkien's writings. Anyway, the final meeting that I want to mention is a big scene featuring King Elendil and King Durin IV. Gilgalad should also be present as these are the three High Kings of the Last Alliance, but apart from a few brief moments with Eärendil back in Season 3, we have never seen a meeting between a Dwarf of Khazad Doom and a Numenorian. Elendil and Durin IV are, on the one hand, from entirely separate worlds, and they seem to have very little in common, yet on the other hand, they are true equals. The greatest kings of the greatest kingdoms of their respective races. And together it is these three kings who will either lead the Last Alliance to victory, or die upon the battlefield. Potentially, both. Now, if we follow Tolkien's timeline to the letter, we'll actually need to spend three years in Rivendell, building this last alliance and making preparations for the war to end the Second Age. And although a three-year time jump would be a good way of demonstrating just how big of a deal the last alliance is, I can see the argument why another time jump so close to the end of the story might like undercut the immediacy of what's happening. It's not great for pacing, and it would be a little bit weird for Isildur to spend three years away from Gondor while his brother Anarion is alone on the front lines. There totally are ways to include these three years, but they'd have to involve inventing a few new scenes, and honestly, there are more important moments for me to get into, so for the sake of this video, I will condense those three years in Rivendell down to a few months. Perhaps at the end of those months, there can be another great council, sort of like a proto-council of Elrond, where all our main characters finalize and formalize their alliance. They can bid farewell to Eärendil and Valandil and Celebrian and the other non-combatants, and then we are finally ready for the good guys to strike back, for the War of the Last Alliance to officially begin. So, first, the three High Kings must move their respective armies from the western side of the Misty Mountains to the eastern side, from Eriador to Rovanion. And all the inspiration that we could possibly need for this next part of our adaptation is right here on Tolkien's map. There are a number of ways to cross the Misty Mountains from Rivendell, and I'm imagining perhaps like an elite vanguard, potentially led by Elrond and Isildur, might take the High Pass that's right behind Rivendell. That's the same pass that Bilbo and the Dwarves will use in The Hobbit. And I mention this High Pass because it introduces an important detail that'll come back right at the end of this series. Tolkien told us that before the Alliance came to Mordor, Sauron sent as many orcs as he could spare up into the Misty Mountains to harry and waylay his enemies as they try to cross. So as this elite vanguard led by Isildur descends the eastern slopes of the mountains and they enter into the wilds of Rovanion, a warband of orcs spies them. They are in a position to ambush these soldiers and slaughter them in the highlands, but they don't. You see, the soldiers of the Last Alliance, they follow their kings out of loyalty and duty and love 
But Sauron's orcs do not love him. They are not loyal to his cause. They are cowardly brutes motivated by hate. Against a heavily armed and highly trained vanguard of top warriors, all of these orcs will surely be killed, and turns out these orcs fear the steel of the Alliance more than their master far off in Mordor. So instead of attacking the vanguard, the orcs scurry back up into the Misty Mountains to await easier prey. Sauron has screwed himself over with his own tyranny. Anyway, as I say, I'll come back to the specific orc warband of the Misty Mountains and that theme of self-defeating evil towards the end of the next video, and if you know how this story goes, you can probably guess why I'm mentioning this. But I think the bulk of the Last Alliance, they should cross into the East via the same route that the Fellowship of the Ring will take in over 3,000 years' time, the passage under the mountains, khazad Doom. I think there's potential for a really cool sequence showing the alliance of elves and men and dwarves all marching south together through the now ancient ruins of Eregion into the halls of khazad Doom and then out the other side, down the Silverlode River towards the Golden Wood, all armed and arrayed for war. Which brings us to the other reason why I mentioned that invented woodland bridge between the realms of Galathorn and Thranduil, that bridge over the Anduin. Whilst most of our main characters were preparing in Rivendell, Celeborn has been working to persuade his fellow Sindar princes to allow their forests to be the last alliance's final haven before they march upon the Black Gate, and Celeborn has convinced them to widen their bridge so that the armies of the Last Alliance may cross the river without delay. I mean, I'm aware that a bridge might not be the most cinematic storyline to invent in a Middle-earth adaptation, but I do think it's worth spending a short amount of time on. I really don't want to have characters teleporting wherever the plot needs them to be. This is Middle-earth. This is Tolkien. The journey matters. And so I think we should demonstrate how does a massive army like the Last Alliance swiftly cross a massive river like the Anduin. It'll make the world feel more real, and it's also a nice way of exploring our Alliance theme. Bridges, you know, connect people. This bridge literally unites two woodland kingdoms, and it demonstrates that every single group of free peoples are playing their part in the War of the Last Alliance. Anyway, it is in this woodland realm that Gil-galad's army is reinforced and enriched by the armies of Galathorn and Thranduil. And once all the elves and men and dwarves and birds and beasts have gathered, and once the great river has been crossed, the high kings Gil-galad, Elendil, and Durin IV lead their armies onward to Mordor. And once the green woodlands are behind them, the Last Alliance faces the final stage of its journey. 100 leagues of desert. Finally, our heroes are entering the dominion of the Dark Lord. After days of marching and riding through somber desolation, the Last Alliance eventually comes to the razor-sharp labyrinth of hills known as the Emin Wheel. They are now barely a stone's throw from the Black Gate. And it's in the Emin Wheel that I imagine the Alliance would unite with their final batch of warriors. Atop the high cliffs waits King Anarion, with a large company of Gondorian soldiers ready for battle and among them are the fighting men of Harad, warriors of both those factions, flying both banners, the Red Hawk of their king and the Black Serpent of his rival. Noticeably, however, the men of the White Mountains are not present. Once again, they have broken their oath and refused to fight for Isildur. Anyway, during a very rainy night, 
Great eagles and other birds of the Alliance fly south from the Emin Wheel to spy out the lands ahead, and they return with news of the enemy's strength and whereabouts. And the birds report that the Black Gate is open. A single warband of orcs is preparing for battle, but the bulk of Sauron's army cannot be seen. Now, both Gil-galad and Elendil agree that they should rest, they should build a strategy and then begin the greatest battle of the Second Age in the light of day and on their own terms, but not everyone agrees. The woodland Galadhrim, they want to launch a surprise attack right now. They are, after all, wood elves, stealth and ambush are their preferred styles of war, and they reckon that by striking in the night, they can take the armies of Mordor unaware. They can win the war before Sauron even knows that they're here. Also, a big part of King Galathorn's personality is that he's a pretty prideful guy who really doesn't like the Noldor. He's come to fight Sauron, but as a Sindarin king of the Woodland, the commands of High King Gilgalad of the Noldor mean nothing. Galathorn convinces Thranduil to join him, and together the woodland armies depart the Emin Wheel to launch a surprise attack against the forces of Mordor. Galathorn begins the battle against the orders of High King Gilgalad. And among the men of the Last Alliance, something very similar happens. The Haradrim, who fly the banners of the Black Serpent, make the exact same argument about Elendil that Galathorn made about Gilgalad. Elendil is High King of the Dúnedain, not of the Haradrim. The Haradrim have their own kings, why should they be beholden to the orders of Elendil? Now, I imagine that Anarion would really try to dissuade the Haradrim from this line of thinking, as surely Celeborn would also try to do with Galathorn and Thranduil. But, in the end, the majority of the Haradrim follow the Galathrim to launch a surprise attack upon Mordor by night. Which brings us to the first major battle of the War of the Last Alliance. Now, in the Unfinished Tales, we are given an account of a very similar battle featuring characters that unfortunately we just don't have the rights to name, so this is going to have to be an invented battle, but I've tried to include as many threads from the writings that we can use as possible. And the first thread that I want to use this battle to explore is a seemingly throwaway line from Fellowship of the Rings, Council of Elrond chapter. In that chapter, Elrond says, in all the long wars with the Dark Tower, treason has ever been our greatest foe. And I find this line really interesting, because considering the evidence that Tolkien gives us, I'm not quite sure if it's true. Or rather, it's not really supported by Second Age lore. Treason of kin unto kin is a massive part of the First Age, but I can't really think of any example in the Second or Third Ages where treason played a significant role in the Wars with the Dark Tower. Pride, deception, fear, ambition, these could all be considered great foes in the Long Wars with the Dark Tower, but treason? Not really, not in the Second Age. So I think if we are going to have to invent some things, then this treason that Elrond speaks of in The Lord of the Rings should be part of what's explored. And, of course, it is this treason that I've been building towards with the whole Red Hawk, Black Serpent thing among the Haradrim. After journeying with the Wood Elves under the cover of night, and finally coming within sight of the Black Gate, the leader of the Black Serpent finally reveals his treachery. He stands beside his distant cousin, the King of the Red Hawk, and the Good King reinforces the importance of kinship between them. He says that when the war is over, their lands in Harad will prosper again. The Black Serpent agrees. Yes, they will. And then, he draws his sword, and before the Black Gate of Mordor, he murders his cousin and his king. The Lord of the Black Serpent unfurls his banners and declares his loyalty to Sauron. And in an instant, the planned ambush turns into a massacre. 
Followers of the Black Serpent ruthlessly betray the Haradrim of the Red Hawk, and before the Black Gate itself, the faithful men of Harad are murdered by their own countrymen. The War of the Last Alliance begins with disaster. And in the very moment that the loyal Haradrim are betrayed and chaos breaks out, a man of the Black Serpent blows his horn and the armies of Mordor spring their trap. Suddenly, the elves and men are the ones being ambushed. In Chapter 14 of The Two Towers, Tolkien wrote, Beneath the hills on either side of the Black Gate was bored into a hundred caves and maggot holes. There a host of orcs lurked, ready at a signal to issue forth like black ants going to war. And this is what I'm imagining for this scene. Orcs swarming from these secret maggot holes within the rocks, thousands suddenly spawning onto the battlefield and overwhelming the surviving Haradrim and the Galadhrim. This isn't really a battle anymore, it's just carnage and treason and slaughter. I've said many times before on this channel that Tolkien's writing should not be taken as allegory. We should not be projecting Tolkien's own wartime experiences, for example, onto the wars of Middle-earth. Tolkien himself said as much in Letter 226. However, there is an exception. In that same letter, Tolkien divulged that, perhaps in landscape, the dead marshes and the approach of the Morannon owe something to northern France after the Battle of the Somme. And what I'm talking about here is taking place in exactly that part of the world. The elves and men who die here will, in 3000 years time, become the bodies that Frodo and Sam encounter in the Dead Marshes. Moranon is simply the Sindarin word for Black Gate. And so, if there ever were a place and a time in Tolkien's adaptation where it is appropriate to take inspiration from the horrors of World War I, and specifically the Somme, I think this would be it. I'm imagining that rain has turned the ashen ground to mud. Arrows fly like bullets and bodies float face down in these bloody pools. I think to really capture just how horrifying this battle is, we need to pick a single character and kind of witness the carnage through their eyes. And I very strongly believe that this character should be Thranduil. I'm imagining that pretty early on in this fight, Thranduil would be wounded by a stray arrow. He would fall in the mud, and as he lies there, he looks up and he sees that all around him, his people are being slaughtered. Galathorn, his fellow king, is butchered by a whole bunch of orcs, brutally slain, and his blood seeps into the mud while his body is trampled under orc feet. The Galathrim, with their light knives and their slender bows, are massacred, one by one, and the faithful men of Harad are killed beside them. The figure that Tolkien gives us in The Unfinished Tales is that two-thirds of the woodland army are killed in this battle, two thirds. This is the trauma that will define so much of Thranduil's character for the next 3,000 years. This is the reason that Elves of the Greenwood will retreat so far north in the early Third Age. It's the reason that the Elves of the Golden Wood will become so isolationist by the time of the Lord of the Rings. I mean, the awakening of the Balrog didn't help, but at the end of the Second Age, a great woodland army marched south to war, but only a handful returned. King Galathorn and the majority of his Galadhrim will remain buried in the mud for millennia. And as their graves are slowly swallowed up by the foulness of this region, their final resting place shall become known as the Dead Marshes. And the slaughter that Thranduil witnesses here changes the role that Wood Elves will play throughout the Third Age. The Sindar and the Sylvan will continue to dwell in the forests of Rovanion, 
but their lands will become massively depopulated. Their realms will shrink immensely, and their kingdoms will never again even come close to the size and the grandeur that they reached before this battle. But as Thranduil lies, bleeding, watching his people die and his hope die with them, he suddenly feels the thunder of hooves approaching from the north. He hears the call of an eagle, and the battle cry of the dwarves, and the coming of the three high kings. The sun begins to rise. The orcs pull back, the surviving elves and faithful Haradrim regroup, and the rest of the last alliance descends upon the enemy. And as they do, the Great Battle of Dagorlad officially begins. The greatest battle since the War of Wrath, which brought a cataclysmic end to the First Age. And that is, perhaps a little frustratingly, where I'm going to have to end this video. There's a lot more story to tell in Season 5, but I will tell it in the next video. And I hope that what you've heard so far has got you excited for the finale. The last few episodes to tie this entire three and a half thousand year long Rings of Power story together. I will talk about the Battle of Dagorlad, the Siege of Barad-dûr, the Battle of Sauron, Elendil, and Gilgalad, the moment Isildur cuts the ring from Sauron's finger, and how I imagine everything that I have talked about over these, like, 10 hours worth of videos should end. So, to make sure you don't miss that, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to hit like and leave a comment with your thoughts if you want to. However, until next time, until the finale, as always, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy, and Nevair Melanine.